Hey, everybody. So this is uh, physical security in context, of course. I'm Skylar Town. Um, Skylar Town at Shoebox and Lock GD, which, of course, is pronounced Lock God, just if you need the update. Um, OK, so <laughs> this morning, a friend of mine sent me an article from the New York Times from back in 2010. And I have no idea how he happened to stumble across it. Um, but it was interesting. It was about people who don't lock their doors in New York City. And I read the whole thing, and I really liked it. At the end of reading it, I said, I'm going to rewrite my talk from scratch for a sector this morning. Um, so this is a little different than what I had originally planned, but it's still physical security in context. I'm just putting it in a deeper context than I had intended to. OK. So the big questions here, why do you lock your door? Why don't your employees? This isn't explicitly about locking doors. But why do you care about your security policy? Why don't your employees care about your security policy? Um, oh, man, that's going to be obnoxious. Hold on. There we go. Um, and where did we get this burglars will be burglars mentality? Why, why do we just believe that no matter what, burglars will get in and burgle us? Um, where did that start, and why, and why do we still believe it? And uh, finally, we're going to, of course, discuss threat mitigation. I'm going to talk about a couple of very specific attacks, a couple of specific scenarios, but hopefully with um, just some larger lessons and, and get you into the right frame of mind for security thinking. OK. Being that I just rewrote this entire thing this morning, I don't know what my timing is, so I'm going to move a little quick. And I got some extra time at the end. That'd be great for questions. Here we go. So why do you lock your door? This is cuneiform. We're going to take this back a long way. So uh, until recently, we've believed that locks were invented in Egypt, about 2,000-ish BC. Um, it's another hour-long talk to explain it, but short version is pretty sure they were actually invented in Mesopotamia, a little before that. Um, so this right here means lock master. <clears throat> and the lock master was a position invented in the Neo-Assyrian era in Mesopotamia because people kept getting killed. So uh, one Mesopotamian king was killed in his bedchamber. The next one was just barely, just barely managed to escape death in his bedchamber. Because even though they had security, even though they even had locks, and even though they had human beings, all of these things were a single source of control. The guard would also control the lock and would control the human population that was walking in and out. So if you murder the guard, or if the guard's your buddy, uh, you can walk in and kill the king. And king number three said, well, that's dumb. I want to stop getting killed. Uh, and so he implemented the world's first two-factor authentication. He separated out the locks from the guards. So now the locks would be controlled by a man named the Lockmaster, who is part of the total security solution for the palace. But this man would literally hold the tumblers for the lock in his hand and walk around to them. And he, when he wanted to go into a secure room, he would put them in place and walk off with the key so nobody else could have it. That guy did not deal with the general public. He did not deal with people that wanted access to the king. He was just called in to open up the door. And if he wasn't called in to open up the door by the right person, then he wasn't going to open up the door. So now you have to murder or bribe two people. And that turned out to be enough, because this Mesopotamian king managed to recapture all sorts of important stuff back then. I very quickly lose what I know as soon as we get away from locks. I know a lot of stuff, but only if it's connected to locks. I recently met a man from Vienna, and I said, oh, what do you do in Italy? Because I didn't know where Vienna was, because I'm an idiot. But I can tell you all about Napoleon's trip into Egypt, because they discovered some cool locks there. Anyway, Rob Sakate. Rob Sakate is how we pronounce that currently, and at some point in time, I'll probably get it tattooed on me. But the important thing is here is to put this in context. Some of the first locks were just seals. All they were meant to do was alert you to the fact that there had been entry into your facility. And they weren't always perfect, either. Um, there was a Roman man, a famous story about a Roman man. This was famous back in his day, um, back around you know year zero, who would seal up his stores every night, his, uh, you know, basically his food supplies, his wine, et cetera, et cetera. So he would seal it every night, and then he would throw his seal into the room, thinking, aha, they can't get my seal, and if they crack the seal, I'll know it. If you haven't seen the fly yet, what his servants did was crack the seal every night, and then resealed it with his ring and threw it back in the room. 
So he would wake up to less wine every day. Um, so the seals could be circumvented if they weren't properly implemented. They were having problems with this thousands of years ago. Um, but the first mechanical locks evolved from seal concepts. Uh, the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, were all about seals. They would actually carry physical seals around their necks um, to identify property and so on and so forth. So one of the uh, most common seals for doors is just a large wooden peg that went through the door. On the opposite side, there would be a connection for that peg, and then you would have a seal placed over the peg with an elaborate scene on it. So that if somebody was going to breach that door, they'd have to break the seal, and there was no simple way of recreating it. Definitely not perfectly. So the word for that peg was sikatu. As it turns out, the word for the pins in the first mechanical lock is also sikatu. So this uh, phenomenal uh, uh, archaeologist and linguist, um, there, were two, there were two of them, but the Karen Radner was the one that made the final connection, um, realized that we have a linguistic evolution between these two concepts. And so I was talking to her, and I said, well, since we have a linguistic evolution, could we state that we might have a mechanical evolution between the two concepts as well? So this is how we arrived at uh, Rob Sakate, the lock masters, much later, the birth of the first mechanical lock as a means of two-factor authentication. OK, so that's why we began using locks back then. So, oops, wow. So back then, locks were seals, and they were some of the first means of two-factor authentication. Locks today are seals, occasionally means of two-factor authentication, but also social constructs. And we get caught up in these social constructs, that the lock has an incredible bearing on us societally, personally, etc. Now, I love researching the anthropology of locks. I love the sociology of locks. I love how locks have allowed us to live ever closer as this world gets tighter and tighter and tighter full of people. I think the locks are amazing and have some of the best stories in the world. However, all of that sociology, anthropology, etc., will get carried by individuals into business settings, but businesses do not actually enjoy that same social contract that individuals do. So we can't think like that when we're securing a facility or a corporation. So why don't your employees lock their doors, lock, lock your doors? Why don't they follow the same security that you would want for your own business? Well, this again goes back to the social contract. This is from the article that I was sent this morning. A person's idea of safety is tied to variables that are very illogical, but are part of the story they tell themselves. I like this a lot, and I like some of the thinking. The article touched on a lot of the emotional implications of security and talked about people in New York City who refused to lock their doors, um, even though they were in the middle of, you know, crime-riddled New York, et cetera, et cetera. And talked to police and talked to all sorts of other people. But I really like this idea a lot, that people carry around them their own concept of security tightly, tightly tied into their own history, their own story, their own uh, uh, interactions with the locks. Every person they profiled in the story, they would talk about their childhood as well. They would talk about the fact that, oh, this woman grew up in a horrible household, got taken in by a foster family in the country who never locked their doors, but that was the place that she felt safest. And therefore, she's associated the two things with each other, right? But it is illogical. We actually have an emotional context for security. And the fact is, everybody comes in with their emotional context for security. Unfortunately, the main emotional context for security is, meh, if I'm screwed, I'm screwed. My time is up. It's this weird fatalistic thing. <clears throat> I apparently accidentally copy-pasted that slide several times. This is what happens when you put a slide deck together at 6 in the morning and completely change everything you're doing. But that's good. It'll be good to keep reminding you of that question. It's a good question to ask yourself. OK, so uh, physical security versus social security. I obviously am not talking about social security as in the uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, financial, you get older and things work out fine program. Um, I'm talking about social security as in the social construct of locks. Locks really are as much a social construct as they are a mechanical construct. And you need to separate these two ideas out when you're talking about institutional security. Really, it would be better if you could separate these two, two ideas out anytime you're securing anything, but particularly in, the, in, in that concept, in, in an institutional space, you have to separate these ideas. Because corporate personhood does not mean that you are a part of that social contract. Nobody will really care. Nobody in your community will care. Nobody will see the same taboos as breaking into a facility as they will into someone's home. Our homes are treasured, and we all have them. Most of us do not have institutions. We do not 
afford them the same value. Therefore, people will trespass against you, and you cannot rely on the social contract that most people rely on to prevent intrusion. <clears throat> okay. There's also this constant belief that determined attackers will find a way. And that's very true. If you have a perfectly determined attacker who will never stop, then yes, they will eventually find a way. But do you know the number of people that are actually like that? It's very, very few. I was talking to somebody at one point in time who, uh, um, this was recently, I was at a concert, and somebody's like, man, all my chickens keep getting killed by this bear. I'm living in Vermont right now. Um, so all my chickens are getting killed by this bear. And this other guy's like, oh, man, here's the security system I have to protect my chickens, because two people at this concert happen to have chicken coops. Um, so they're describing their security policies to one another about protecting their chickens. And then the guy at the end, at the end of hearing this long security policy that he has to protect his chickens, he said, no, it's a bear. He ripped the door off. And I thought, you know what? The bear might be one of the few determined attackers in this world um, who will not stop until they eat your chicken. Most people can be deterred, can be pointed at a different target. There, there are the, you know, the small number of sociopaths or bears uh, who might really want to get into your company. But for the most part, we need to get rid of this idea. We need to stop being fatalistic about security. Mechanical security still has a place, and it's part of a layered security. Um, Program. So, where did the idea come from? Why did we start saying, ah, burglars will be burglars, we're all screwed anyway? It's actually a really elaborate story that I'm going to tell you very quickly. So, I, <laughs> there are two things that I hear at conferences all the time that make me crazy. I hear, oh, locks only keep honest people honest. This guy's picking locks. He must think that too. I don't think that. I think locks is really important and just nobody cares. But locks keep honest people honest. I hate that expression and I hear it all the time. The other thing that I hear all the time, and this is an aside, people walk up to me and just tell me about felonies they've committed because they think that, you know, I, I'm a miscreant. I love locks. I, I don't want to know about the horrible things that you've done with lock picking. So know that. Okay. Um, so how did we get here? Um, how did we get at the locks keep honest people honest and that is as much as they can offer us? Well, after the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians and the Romans, for a long period of time, the technology of locks was awful. It was just terrible. It was all warded locks. They were very easy to open. As soon as you understood the concept of the lock, you could open it. And that is what the world understood locks to be. Locks had to be a layered solution. If they weren't a layered solution, it had to be really, really elaborate, and even then, it was all security by obscurity. So as soon as somebody understood how your lock functioned, they would be able to open it. Well, that all changed around 1778 with the invention of the first lever lock. Now, the first lever lock was invented by a guy named Barron. Uh, for whatever reason, I couldn't find a picture of Barron, so this is what came up. I don't know why. Um, but it doesn't matter they don't have a picture of him, because in reality, this was invented by some French guy probably 20 years before. Um, but we don't know who that was, because it's just listed in a French catalog, one of the first lever locks predating Barron's work. Um, but all of that said, there was a guy named Bird who took the really simple, I also couldn't find a picture of him. Uh, there was a guy named Bird who took the very simple lever lock ideas and transformed them into how we know lever locks today. But it doesn't really matter that I don't have a picture of him, because the most important security changes came from a guy named Joseph Brahma, who looked at Barron's original lever lock. He was there when it was first presented to the Royal Society in England, and he l literally wrote a letter saying, ah, good idea, but here's a list of ways that it could be improved. That list came to fruition as, history of, as the history of the lever lock came on. So why didn't Brahma implement all those changes himself and have the world's best lever lock decades before anybody else came up with any of that? Because he had a much crazier idea. Bam. So this is his safety lock. 1784, he rolls it out onto the market. This is the first time, the first time in a very, very long time, in thousands of years, that a man could hand you a lock and say, though I made this, I cannot open it. If I sold you a lock, you would not be able to open it, even if you both owned the same lock with different keys. Every single one of you can have a lock that works exactly like this. Mass production, one of the first uh, examples of this in the lock making world, and yet inspecting it, you wouldn't be able to open each other's locks. So this was sea change. This, uh, this changed everything in the security world. Um, lever locks are, are well known and well used now, but it was the safety lock that really created the biggest, um, the biggest change. And it came at a really important time too. 
So Louis the Sixteenth over in France, um, a couple of years after this, uh, things are going really badly. Uh, it turns out that Louis was also an avid locksmith. He was trained by the master locksmith Gamain um, in Versailles. Gamain was also a builder, an architect, made some beautiful stairs, some beautiful art. You can find all of that online somewhere. But most importantly, he was the only man who Louis the Sixteenth had to call master because Louis loved locks. Dumas wrote about Gamain. Everybody wrote about Gamain. Together, the two of them built the Armoire de Fer. Um, the armoire was a cabinet that had a secure safe in it, secured by a lock that the two of them built together. Unfortunately for Louis, it turned out that Gamain was a Jacobite. He, when the revolution came, he turned over the information about the safe to the Revolutionary Council, who, not with Gamain, they didn't have to have him with him. All he had to do was explain how it worked, just like all those locks that came before, and the council were able to open the armoire, open the safe, and find a pile of treasonous documents that Louis had kept there because he thought that Gamain was his brother and that he could secure things there. Apparently, Marie Antoinette was not a big fan of Gamain, so she got some of the worst stuff out of there, but still, it didn't go well for him. And everybody found out that it didn't go well for him. There was a beheading of a king. People find out about that sort of thing, and people knew who Gamain was. He was considered a traitor in most of, uh, in most of the rest of monarchical Europe. Um, re it's funny reading about Gamain in a modern context and then reading about him in the Victorian age because the British hated Gamain because they sure did like their royalty. Um, so there's a lot of funny stuff about him being a horrible little crippled black-hearted man. Um, but anyway, the important thing was this was a moment at which everyone said, wow, that old lock technology really ain't the best. King Louis had the best locksmith in the world and lost his head over some treasonous documents. All sorts of other stuff he lost his head for too, but I don't know about that because it's not related to locks. Okay, so uh, well, that doesn't look readable at all. I'll read it from here. Um, Brahma, having invented his lock and having perfected it, put this up in the window of his Piccadilly shop. It reads, the artist who can make an instrument that will pick or open this lock shall receive 200 guinea the moment it is produced. This was one of the first major physical security contests in the world. And as important as it was that Brahma brought us some of the best technology that we had had in thousands of years, I genuinely think that this, this public contest to test this, his security, anybody was allowed to take a trial against it. They, they were given 30 days to try against it. I genuinely believe that this was the more important contribution to security. So, uh, in 1818, there was uh, another phenomenal lock invented, but we're going to talk about that a little later. That was Jeremiah Chubb with a detector lock. Uh, we're going to bring that up in a bit. So let's have a look here. Why was everything awful for so long and then all of a sudden in this tight period of time amazing inventions started coming out and amazing innovation and so on and so forth? Well there were a couple of things. Um, let's see. Uh, the, the, this right here was the birth of the idea of perfect security. And we had never before believed in the idea of perfect security. So innovation continued because all of a sudden we were working in a space that had never had any success before and we're now holding public contests where people can try locks against each other. There were mechanic in, mechanics institutes where people would come and put a bounty on a lock that they had invented. And the picker would come and match that bounty. If the picker opened the lock without breaking it, they got the, the lock maker's bounty. If they broke the lock in the process, the lock maker got their money, but that picker got to keep the lock so they could study it, and so they could make their own things, and so they could, they could talk with the, with the lock maker about it. The Royal Society in England, in a phenomenal precursor to the modern open source movement, funded research into physical security with the important caveat that you were not allowed to patent anything they funded. It was for the public good, and everybody was allowed to use it and put it in their own designs. The innovation was incredible, and it was easily the most exciting time in physical security the world has ever seen. And it was the birth of perfect security. So the question is, how did we lose this? Well, what happened here was that for 73 years, Brahma's lock will get picked in 1851, and I'll explain how. But for 71 years, from the invention of his lock to 1851, it remained unpicked and boldly in the middle of a store window, unpicked. That lock from 1818 also remained unpicked until 1851. That is four generations of people being born into the idea of perfect security. People lived and died with the belief that the security arms race was finally over. And the lock business boomed with people installing locks everywhere, using locks in different contexts than they had ever had before. A lot of this period of time relates directly to how we use locks today. Unfortunately, so does the next part. 
Hobbes comes over from America to pick everyone's locks. This guy, um, he went to the Crystal Palace in 1851. Uh, the Crystal Palace was the site of the Great Exhibition of 1851, which actually ran into 1852. Um, he went there actually, uh, oh, sorry, uh, his, his best feat in America. He made a name for himself in America by traveling around going to banks and saying, if I can open your vault, you have to buy my lock. And he sold a lot of locks. His best known feat, this is actually written about in his obituary, despite everything else that he accomplished. He was at the, um, it wasn't actually the Mercantile Exchange, it was the Mercantile something, I can't quite remember the name now, but best picture I could find. Um, they were having a contest. They had a large vault and they offered $500 to anyone who could open it given 30 days to work on it. Given 30 days to work on it. That right there is confirmation of the idea of perfect security. Japan is the only country in the world that I know of right now that tests against surreptitious entry for their locks. One of the only ones in the world because they discovered they had a bad problem with it in their cities. So they started testing and giving grades for surreptitious entry for picking. The best rating you can get is surviving two rounds of 15 minutes of attack. 30 days. He did it in an hour. Hobbes was changing the game. He was changing everything with his methods of picking. Hobbes was not the one to originate the tentative method, which is what we use now today. That happened uh, not long after the invention of the safety lock and led to some improvements in the safety lock, but he definitely perfected it. So he was over at the Great Exhibition because he was actually shilling for the Day and Newell Company, a uh, lock that he had been helping them build. This was one that he also sold while he was in America. So he was bringing this over to exhibit and figured, you know, what, what better way to exhibit my lock than to pick the best British locks that are out there. I'm just another inside view. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of it. Um, it's the paratoptic lock. Uh, it's a Greek word having something to do with hiding, hidden something. I don't quite remember. Anyway, uh, it was a cool lock, but eventually got opened. So Hobbes is over in England, and um, when he opens the locks, it happens in such a dramatic way, and at such an such a moment of height for the Americans at the Great Exhibition and a low moment for the British at the Great Exhibition. So after he opens the Brahma and the Chubb lock, this came out in the, in the Times of London. We believed before the exhibition opened that we had the best locks in the world. And among us, Brahma and Chubb were reckoned quite as impregnable as Gibraltar. Even more so for the key to the Mediterranean was taken by us some years ago. It seems cruel at this time of day when men have been taught to look on their bunches of keys with something of a sense of security to scatter that feeling to the winds. They're phenomenal writers. But it was heartbreak. It was like actual national heartbreak that these locks were open. The Chubb lock, he opened walking across the floor of the Great Exhibition. Someone said, hey, here's a Chubb lock. Think you can open this? And he, you know, it was open. I'm sure it didn't happen quite that casually, but you know, he was stopped before he'd even set up for shop and open one of their two impregnable locks. The uh, Brahma took a lot longer, and Brahma learned from it, improved it. The Brahma lock is sold to this day, as a matter of fact, um, as a high security lock, and it continues to be a phenomenal lock. That guy was hundreds of years ahead of his time when he came out with that. So, what happened after that? So around 1861, um, I believe it was either 1861 or 1862, there was another um, great exhibition in France, uh, and people were picking locks all over that as well. And the national interest for a decade had been about the lock controversy, and there are so many articles about it, letters to the editor. Um, but what we see after this period of time is that as the century continues, the ignorance dramatically increases. If you look into the popular media of the time, you will see in that you know, the halcyon moment of 1851 to 1860-61, article after article after article that not only talk about and praise and wonder about and talk about the next competition, but they also describe methods of opening. They have illustrations of the tools being used to open locks and long discussions about what's going on at the different mechanic institutes. Punch Magazine in 1851, I don't believe I have the quote, Punch Magazine in 1851 published an article. Uh, Punch was sort of the onion of its day, only with a lot more poetry. Um, but they published a quote saying, we're concerned by the quote. I don't have the quote. Um, 
There we go. You'll see the team crumpets thing in a second. Um, I think I talked about punch in a moment. Hold on, let me get to it. <laughs> so because of that ignorance by 1900, it really is as though none of this period of time happened whatsoever. Um, people are now, the press are now talking about uh, skeleton keys, which were an attack for those old warded locks that anybody could open. They're, they're now flummoxed when a 12-year-old boy is able to escape from his jail cell in New Jersey, which is another phenomenal story about these deaf-mute lock-picking brothers, but it's for another time. Feel free to ask me about it. Um, but the ignorance just continues to increase. So, why? Public intolerance. So again, remember, for generations of people believed in the idea of perfect security. The world had actually changed for just long enough for everyone to forget what it had been like. It was a new world for security and for how normal individual people would use security. There was actual large criminal classes and unrest, and that's somebody throwing a fox up in the top left, which seems awful. <laughs> and the security boom actually improved things culturally and socially and physically in the world that people lived in, particularly in London, which for quite a long time had been the pacemaker. All of that began to crumble when Hobbes rolled in and opened those locks. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't put this wall back together. And for a decade, for more than a decade, for a lot of people, they believed it would. They believed we would get back to perfect security. And yet every new lock that was promised to be the best and the newest and the most you know, unpickable ever got opened. And then even Hobbes' lock himself was opened by a guy named Yale, Linus Yale Jr. here in America, who was playing around with it in his workshop popped it open, probably felt excited for a moment, but in the same moment realized that having opened that, he now knew how to open every lock he had ever invented. And he, at that moment, said, any lock that takes a key can be picked, and started working on dial combination locks and, and died thinking that he had solved it. But of course, we can manipulate those open. Too. Um, this is from Punch. As lockpicking is now being cultivated as a science, we begin to fear that the police may hesitate to interfere when they see an individual engaged in an ingenious operation on a street door. Uh, it goes on to say that, the, uh, that they're worried that the person will be able to easily explain that they're just practicing their art, and that the police will uh, you know, perhaps applaud them in their efforts. Um, it was all tongue-in-cheek and all fairly fun. It said, you know, all of the world's best lockpickers are rolling into town for the great exhibition. And it listed, you know, Hobbes and, and whoever was currently in the Brahma line right then, one of his sons. Uh, list, you know, listed some important security names and then listed the names of criminals um, <laughs> as a big celebratory London event that was happening. It was funny and it was a little cautionary, but really it was just uh, pleasant. A decade later, when all of the locks continued to be picked, they said, they ran another article on the Great Lock Controversy, the enduring Great Lock Controversy. And they said, you know, we understand that you need to pick locks to test their security. We also understand that you need to slice up bodies to better understand anatomy. We don't think either should be done in the street. It wasn't tongue in cheek anymore. And it actually went on to be even angrier. And the public in general were a little disenfranchised at the fact that perfect security was disappearing. It was disappearing in a much more permanent way than any of them had ever imagined. Even that Times of London article, at the end of it, that heartbreaking, scatter that feeling to the winds, it was a rallying cry at the end for their engineers to go and remake the perfect lock. And that never happened. So, that's just a picture of me. That I don't know why it's in there. <laughs> so, reason number two is the rise of the locksmith technician. So during the lock boom, all of a sudden, lock shops started to have employees. That hadn't really happened before. Um, the, the whole of human industry was actually changing at this time as well. Um, there's a phenomenal book called The Work Ethic in America, 1777 to 1850 something, that's really hard to find and really hard to read, but it tells you a lot about all of this sort of stuff, so feel free to look that up. Um, the idea that lock shops would have actual employees instead of an apprentice that would go off somewhere and start his own lock shop, there was now like actual shift wage labor, and these things hadn't happened before. So all of a sudden, we had a huge group of people who were not smiths. They were not making the locks. They were simply repairing them. They were technicians. Still go by the name locksmith, of course. If you have more and more and more and more of them, 
And as they're not making locks and they're just repairing locks or picking locks or opening locks or replacing locks or installing locks, you have the locksmith technician. Again, we went from smiths to people that just drill out a lock and slap a new one on there. Unfortunately, this has persisted in a lot of ways. Uh, and locksmithing at that time and to this day um, understood that secret knowledge equaled money in their pockets. None of these things are me trying to say anything bad about locksmiths or the locksmithing community. There are amazing people in that community that love exploring security the same way that all of us do. Unfortunately, there are also companies out there that will hire a bunch of people, hand them all a set of picks, and say, when you go to that door, pretend to pick the lock for five minutes, then drill it out, replace the cylinder, and charge them three times your costs. And those aren't exaggerations. Google it. You'll find locksmith scams everywhere, and that is actually what's going on. It's heartbreaking. But back then, they formed one of the stronger guilds towards the end of 1900, and many of these guild systems and their offshoots continue to exist to this day. If you want to get a job as a locksmith in Texas, the guild system there became law on the books in Texas. You cannot work as a locksmith unless you have worked for a local for two years. No matter your situation, you could have a multi-generational lock shop in Tennessee try to cross the border, you have to work for a local for two years. You know who they're hiring? Their nephews. That guild system is still one of the strongest. And, and guilds have all but disappeared in that sort of secret knowledge way. So, finally, media interest. You know, we went a decade back in 1851 with everybody being constantly excited and interested and on the edge of their seats about what was happening in the Great Lock Controversy. But we never got a perfect lock again. It was just contests, big advertisements. <laughs> Uh, Hobbs and Chubb for years took out editorials yelling at each other that Lair Lock, I, you never picked my lock, I picked your lock fair and square. And all the public would chime in about it. It was practically reality TV, the lock controversy. But it went on for a decade with no actual change. Some cool locks got invented, but eventually people got sick of new technology because every lock got opened by somebody. And it is so hard to keep momentum in the media. A modern example, a guy named Narav Patel started 3D printing, rep wrapping keys for his doors. And it was pretty slick. It was pretty cool. He used, uh, I believe, OpenSCAD and, and figured out the, um, the biddings and everything so you could just type in the bidding for a lock and it would print him out a key that would function as lock. Very cool. He happened to be on IRC one night and somebody said, oh man, you need to show this to Skylar Town. Uh, so he dropped me an email. I happened to be in L.A. at the time. He was up in San Francisco, but I had three days, and the rental car company had given me a convertible for no extra charge, so I drove the circumference of California to go have a look at this. Um, <laughs> every day on the way up there, I was like, oh, awesome, I'm going to come to your place. And he was like, oh, you don't really need to do that. That's fine. Uh, and I was like, oh, man, I'm so much closer to your house now. And he was like, it's really okay. I'm sure you have other things to do. Friend was like, I'm six hours from your house, guy. Let me in. Uh, and he did. He did let me in. He turned out to be very nice. And, and though I present as a creep, I'm actually very nice myself. So it worked out beautifully, and we did some great work. So when he published this, it blew up. It hit Gizmodo and Boing Boing and, and everywhere. The, there were, like, paper articles about this. People were so excited. Blew up. The work that we did that night, I said, you know what, this is great, except that people in my community and many locksmiths can just sight read quick sets and schlags, the only locks that he had solved for. It was a community called the Everyday Carry Community who fetishized the things they walk out of the house with. So wallet, watch keys, knife, sometimes guns, flashlights, etc., etc. Very frequently they'll put beautiful resolution photos of all of the things from their pockets on the internet. Very frequently, including their keys. I have a folder on this laptop that is just called Creepin', and it is me trying to find those keys and associate addresses with them. And I've done it for a lot of them, and that's just in my spare time. Um, so, you know, we get a picture of a key, or I used to follow, <laughs> total creep. Um, as I said, I present as a creep. Uh, when in Vegas, sometimes my friends will be gambling, most of them make much more money than me, so I will have busted out of the like $100 that I brought really early, and as they're still at the craft tables or whatever, I'll just go wandering around and looking at people who will wear their keys on the outside of their body, say reading their keys and seeing how many I can get in my head. Um, kind of like Lord Nikon from Hackers. If you, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so it didn't really, I, I wasn't too excited about the fact that he did this. What I was excited about was the fact that he was curious about it. So I went there and I gave him uh, an Abus Plus 8850. 
What we did that night, not having measurements, not having any of the specs on the lock, but having a handful of cutaways and a fistful of keys, is he in OpenSCAD managed to program out a new key that would operate in this lock. After several trials, we finally got a, uh, um, basically we had to fully print. There was no honeycombing inside of the key, otherwise it would snap. So it was a solid, like Lego plastic key, basically, that conformed to the keys that we already had there. And as I left, we put it into the lock, we attempted to open it, and it came so close, but it didn't quite get there. And I was really disappointed because we had worked so hard and we had gotten so close, but I had to make a flight the next day at like 7, and I had to drive from San Francisco back to L.A., so I had to book it. Half an hour later, I got a message from him saying, I got it open. I got it open with the same key. And not only was that cool because of all the work that we had done that night, but it even it, it taught me something fundamental about disk detainer locks, which I was actually talking about here last year, and that is that the sidebar seeks its home. The sidebar in these locks is rounded, and it's in an angled uh, housing. And so when you put enough pressure on it, all it wants to do is force its way into the correct slot in the tumblers inside of the lock. And if what you're using to force it is a semi-hard material, like this plastic, the plastic will actually deform to fit the lock. And that tells me so many things about other attack vectors on this locking concept. I think that I can open these so much faster now. This was a real moment of genuine inspiration after a night of hard work, two strangers, et cetera, et cetera, higher security lock. This was important. And no one cared. It got picked up nowhere. I, have, I, I don't have many, but I have a handful of friends that are even like in the media, and I, I was so excited that I tried to feed it to people, and nobody cared. Nobody published anything. There are no like reblogs of this whatsoever, no comments. It's just completely dead. Um, and so it's really hard to maintain that interest. You know, you'll hit with the novelty, and then when you do the important thing or the next big thing, it's really hard to keep that momentum up. It's hard to keep pushing that car up the hill. So those are the three big reasons that we kind of lost the thread. And it's why, at that moment in time, society collectively said, what we have is good enough. The technology that was around, the lock on your front door, the last major change to it, last major change to the actual cylinder, happened in 1886. And that was the end of what most of us have in our doors. And uh, we developed a social contract, um, obviously not consciously, but everybody just basically decided together, what we have is enough. We live in a society together. These taboos are important. We'll pass more laws. We'll solve this problem with politics. We'll solve this problem with social taboo. We'll solve this problem with law. Nowadays, there are very few societies that don't have locks. Locks have become an inherent part of culture, and societies that live without locks are inherently countercultural. The Occupy movement and their encampments frequently lived without locks. The Romani travelers still live in encampments that don't have locks. And there is a small town in India that does not use locks. And people will say to me, oh, but what about the Midwest? None of us lock our doors. But you still have locks. You're still relying on that social contract. There's a lock in the door. And that lock is a totem of the social contract that we're all abiding by. This town in India, their bank doesn't have locks on it. They are a truly lockless society. And India, at the government level, hates it because they're not allowed to have unsecured banks. So even there, it is countercultural, even when it's an entire in-place community. So we all have locks. We have the social contract, and that's how we buy. That's how we live together. And therefore, we say things like, locks keep honest people honest, because we all know the technology sucks. And it is absurd that I have to say this but locks still have a role in security. Just because the lock on your front door didn't change in more than 100 years doesn't mean that there haven't been intrepid lock makers making beautiful locks. There are two locks on the market right now that have never been picked. And they've been out there for 20 years, 30 years. And the tentative method invented to open every other lock in the world doesn't work on them. They solved it. We're going to find a new way to open them. But for right now, it's solved, and it has been for a while, and nobody cares. But there are still people doing amazing work. And as a result, locks still have a role in security. You just have to use them right. All right, practical threat mitigation. How much time do I have? 
<laughs> some amount of time. You'll wave me off when it's time. No problem. OK, cool. Um, so practical threat mitigation, you want to separate this out into a couple of things. Um, prevention and discovery. Everything that I have said so far is much more practical than maybe it seems. Walking in with the uh, lock masters of Mesopotamia and the social contract and all these ephemeral, you know, near poetic ideas might not seem like fodder for a normal hacker conference or security business conference, whichever way you say this to your bosses. Um, but I swear to you that it is important. That that is the way that everybody in your institution thinks. And if you want to separate out the security that you would have on the front door of your house, where you can rely on that social contract most of the time, with the security of your facility, then you need to ask yourself some more questions. You need to teach your employees a few things. All right, so for threat mitigation, you need to ask, what are you protecting? What is it that you are actually protecting? I often have people ask me about server rooms. One of the easiest things that you can do to protect a server room is take it off the master system for the rest of the, for the rest of this facility. Just separate out the technologies. There's more than one lock out there. There are so many interesting technologies, and you can all use them in concert with each other. What are you protecting? Are you protecting people? Are you protecting data? What physical spaces are the ones that are the most vulnerable? and or the most important? And how much can you divide vulnerability from importance? I'm going to talk about a couple of very specific attacks. This is the regional sidebar attack. This is a Schlage primus. Schlager used institutionally all over North America, the Schlage primus in particular. So what's happening in the side of this lock is that there is a, a series of cuts on the side of the key. These cuts both lift and rotate a number of pins inside of the lock. When all of those pins are able to align, as they are in here, a sidebar can drop down, marrying into those pins, and the lock can turn freely. This is its secondary and higher security locking mechanism. The primary locking mechanism is still a normal pin tumbler mechanism. Unfortunately, Schlage never solved how to master key on the high security mechanism. So in a facility, in a large facility, a campus, whatever, every high security lock there has the same sidebar code. And so internally, for internal security alone, if you have a single functional high security key, and in a lot of places insurance will insist that you have one on the front door of your building, and therefore everybody will have one, if you cut it in half and use it as a tension wrench, you can walk into any other room in the building because they will be so heavily mastered, and if you haven't heard yet, come over and I'll talk about it at the table, the moment you master key a system, you inherently reduce its security. A simple lock in an apartment building that is master keyed probably has 32 keys that could function in that lock in order to produce two keys that will only, one key for the user that won't function anywhere else and one master key. But to do that, you have to fill it with small pins that increase the number of possibilities. That's 32 ways to pick it. In a large facility, it is going to be so heavily mastered that you're going to be able to open it incredibly quickly as long as you can set that sidebar. And if you have a key for anywhere else, you can every single time. Regional sidebar vulnerabilities are not just the domain of Schlage. It's just that, unfortunately for Schlage, their primary locking mechanism is very low security. And we're losing the high security. Let's talk about the simplex magnet attack. Some of you may have heard about this. Simplex are used in a lot of facilities. As it turns out, if you put a big enough magnet on it, it'll just open for you. The way that this works, we've actually known about for a long time. It's uh, slightly different with the magnet and slightly different with the way that it works for simplex. In this case, there is a metal plate that interacts with a series of rotors that are manipulated by the buttons. When all of the buttons are lined up, the plate is able to marry into the rotors, and the whole thing opens freely for you. With the magnet, there's just enough wiggle room that you're physically pulling the plate away, and when you turn the handle, that plate slides above all of the rotors and just doesn't interact with them. But that's how the handle works. This is a problem that we have in a lot of locks. I mean, we've known about things like this in, in mechanical security for a long time. There are a lot of digital security companies now entering the game. They might have a gorgeous authentication mechanism, and yet, the, um, they have a cam separation issue. The, 
cam of the lock is where the knob actually interacts with the latch. Simple way to secure a lock is to separate those two elements. If you've ever approached a door that has a keypad or something like that, and you try the handle, and the handle turns, but the latch doesn't pull back, fairly common, that's cam separation. Unfortunately, it's usually firing a ferrous solenoid. And if you put a big enough magnet on it, you can just drag that solenoid in place, bridging the gap between the handle and the latch, bypassing the authentication mechanism completely. And most of those authentication mechanisms have no audit trail to know when they've been bypassed, when the door has been opened without a code being put in. So you don't even have a detection of that attack having happened. If it's not ferrous or if the magnet isn't working, hit it with a plastic mallet until it goes. And it'll open. Cam separation, it is being put into locks like crazy even though we solved this problem 40 years ago. Because people aren't allowed to look at the secret history of locks and lock picking because it's all taboo. Anyway, now I'm just griping. Get off the master if you have a secure area. I just told you, master king dramatically reduces the security of your facility. You know what? If you want to use Schlage Primus in your security, it's great. They have multi multiple levels of authentication. You can use them with very common just front door cylinders. It is actually a phenomenal system. However, you take your server room and you put it on multi-lock, or you put it on Abloy, and only the guy that needs to go in there has the key. Just take it off the master so that you can completely squash privilege escalation attacks. The regional sidebar isn't the only one of these. I gave an entire t uh, talk uh, at DEF CON a couple of years ago called Attack the Key, Own the Lock. The fact is the best pick for any lock is the key, and we have so many ways of building keys for your locks. So if you have something very sensitive, the easiest thing you can do immediately, immediately to have a real improvement in your security is to take it off of the master system for the rest of your facility. Let that be its own island of security. You need layered security. Think back, to the, think back to the Mesopotamians. The lock is here to provide a second layer of security. It was only in the past couple hundred years that we have let the lock stand by itself. Well, let the lock stand with the social contract we have with each other and trusted just that to secure ourselves. Don't trust just the lock to secure yourself. It can only do so much, and it doesn't have eyes unless you have good auditing systems. So you need the physical security. Use real high security locks. Good names that are out there? Abloy, A-B-L-O-Y, Eva, E-V-V-A, Multilock, M-U-L-T-L-O-C-K. Multilock iterate faster than anybody else in the industry. Medico have some of the best engineers in the world at their company. They don't iterate very quickly. Their front end and their back end don't seem to communicate very well, but they have beautiful locks. They can be picked, they can be, anyway. So you need that physical security, but you also need humans. You need humans that are responsible for security, not just humans that have been told a security procedure. You need to actually embolden individuals with that responsibility. Think about the lockmaster. That lockmaster was beholden to no one when he had those pins in his hand, when he had that key in his hand. That was his job, and he was no longer beholden to the guy that was letting all of the kings get killed. He was beholden to the king. Separate out your security so that somebody is actually responsible for it, because that is the person, or those are the handful of people, that will actually try to think the same way that you do about securing your facility and securing your institution. You need to embolden them with the same, uh, you know, the, the, the same poetry that I'm trying to embolden all of you with about locks. Lastly, education. Yes, everyone will probably ignore it. But if you can put it into real context and you can help them separate out the idea of the security of their home, that social contract, versus the security of your corporation, your institution, make it very clear to them that locks don't just keep honest people honest, that that is out, that that is crap, that you are implementing real security that can actually have a chance if people will get on the program, you might have a shot. A handful of best practices. Key control. Teach your employees. Don't go getting rid of your keys. Also teach them. Uh, apartment buildings are awful at this. If you're in an apartment and you lose your key, they say, that's going to cost you $200 to fix. One of the people mentioned the article that I was talking about that inspired me to change all of this uh, up at the last minute. The reason that he and his roommates do not use their lock is because their landlord said, if you want a key, you're going to have to pay for a copy. 
And it was just a normal lock. I'm confident that the cost of the copy would have been dollars, not you know hundreds of dollars like it would be for some high security situations. None of them wanted to pay it, so they just never use the lock. That's the reason they don't use the lock. It's not that they trust people, they don't want to pay the 20 bucks or whatever. Don't be like a landlord. Make it clear to your, thank you. Make it clear to your employees that if they lose key control, yes, they shouldn't do it. Obviously it sucks, but you want to know about it immediately. <laughs> Think about it like your kid is drinking underage at a party. Oh, you're so mad. But all you want is to get them home safely. And so for that night, for that moment, you won't be mad. You'll be there to pick them up and get them home safely. If your employees lose key control, especially for a secure part of your facility, you need to know immediately and you need to encourage them to come forward and communicate with you and you need to have a plan in place to quickly solve that. There are things called removable cores, changeable cores. Most high security locks have a version of this and it allows you to swap out the physical core of a, of a section of your facility in seconds. You can do it very rapidly without a locksmith coming in and charging you like crazy. There are ways to do this quickly and securely. Sight reading, again, uh, I follow people around in Vegas sight reading their keys just for fun. Uh, if you can get a photo of it, if you can just even get a good look at it for a few seconds, you can probably figure it out. Higher security keys try to mitigate this. It is very difficult to read a multi-lock, especially multi-lock interactive, especially an MT5 Plus that has a new slider mechanism in it, which is their current top of the line, I believe. Crazy difficult to sight read. Eva, all of their products are hard to sight read, um, except maybe the DPS, but that's not high security anyway. Um, uh, Medico are very difficult to sight read unless you've had a lot of practice and you can get a couple of good angles on the key because those cuts are angled, so it's really difficult to read. It's impossible to read from a profile, but you can get it done after a lot of work. All of that said, make sure your employees aren't taking photos of their keys and putting them up on the internet. <laughs> a lot of these people in the EDC community, clearly it's their offices. <laughs> anyway, get off of that master system. Again, this is the easiest thing you can go back to your facility today and do to immediately improve the physical security of your, of your space. There are a lot of people, this is kind of getting overquoted, but there are a lot of people that will say, you know what, you can have the best digital intrusion response defense etc but if somebody can walk out the door with your server you're screwed anyway it's overquoted but it's still true changeable cores I just mentioned them um, look into this uh, S F I C or L F I C large format interchangeable core small format interchangeable core all you really need to worry about is changeable or interchangeable core remember that every high security vendor will have an option for this promise no physical bypass. If you want to move to digital locks, biometrics, keypads, whatever, don't install them with a crappy physical lock bypass. Few of them will have the audit trail to know when they've been opened by a key. Few of them will actually have a very secure cylinder in there, and it just invites new ways for people to wander in. Yeah, you might get screwed for an hour, for two hours, for however long it takes a locksmith to come out and save you if something goes wrong with that digital lock. It is not worth giving everybody a back door in your front door. Don't use physical bypasses to digital security, please. Maybe somebody is in the process of coming up with a great way to do that, but I haven't seen one right now. Audit trails, really insist on them. Insist on them when it's related to key control. If you ever need to lend keys or anything like that, you have to know where they are. Get them stamped, get them numbered, keep a spreadsheet. Know the moment you lose a key. Try to know the moment you lose a key. And audit trails for digital security are even more important. Make sure that those reports are just getting filed and saved. Think about it the same way that you would think about logs. At some point in time, you might just have somebody looking through a pile of logs to burn some time, some intern. Have them look through your pile of physical audit trails and see if people are lining up in places that they're not. Lastly, inspection. Um, before, after, at any point in time, it's worth inspecting your locks, making sure that things continue to function, making sure, uh, even at extreme levels, uh, you know, maybe once a year, maybe longer, pull something apart, make sure that everything still functions, that it hasn't been compromised, that nobody has gotten in there and left tool marks all over it as they've been picking your locks without you knowing. Now let's talk about discovery, and this will wrap it up for me. Um, detector locks, detector locks. One of the best ones was invented back in 1818. Chubb came out with his detector lock. 
This is the one that Hobbs picked on the floor on his way to his booth. Um, it's very cool. It's Jeremiah Chubb. Here's his lock. It's a lever lock. Uh, item K up there, if you lift one of the levers too high, it will trip K. K will then uh, allow E, I believe, to latch. Let me look in here. K. Uh, sorry, F. It's written very small above that sprung bar. F gets tripped. K locks it down, and you can no longer manipulate the lock whatsoever. This was the first detector lock that you could reset with an appropriate key without destroying it. There had always been seals. There had always been detectors, but you'd have to destroy them to find out what had happened to them. Detector locks have been around in a very sophisticated form since 1818, and they are still around to this day. If you have explicitly sensitive documents, the Kaaba Moss X09 is a phenomenal lock. It is made out of plastic. You could probably punch it off of a door. But you will always know that that door has been walked in. To the level, there are all sorts of wonderful features of this lock. It's worth looking into. Um, but one of my favorite parts about it is that even if an attacker comes and steals your lock and puts their own on there, so that the next time you lose it, you use it, you just think it's broken or you've lost your combination, the person that comes to service it, the very first thing they'll do, they don't trust that it's broken. They don't trust that you've screwed something up. They open it up and they compare a UV, uh, they, they look at the light under UV and they compare it to a photograph that they have of the lock when it was delivered because each lock on its way out the door gets randomly sprayed with UV ink so that every one of them is fingerprinted on the way out the door if somebody really wants to go to that effort of completely replacing it so that you don't know they've been there. The moment it's pulled apart to work on, you will know that it has happened. There are still amazing detector locks out there, and these should be your last layer of security. And there are some great, uh, uh, great uh, uh, locks that prevent entry that also have detector mechanisms. Look into those. It's a wonderful part of a layered security plan. Uh, also, forensics. After an incident, you go through digital forensics. Tool mark analysis on locks can tell you a lot. If you have had a physical intrusion or you think you've had a physical intrusion, if you're talking to the police, they are not going to inspect your lock. They just won't. According to the, this is from the article again, according to the FBI's most recent annual uniform crime report of the estimated 2 million plus burglaries committed nationwide in 2008, 32.2% .2 were unlawful entries without force. Someone from the New York City Police Department reported that uh, of the 19,000 plus burglaries, 5,000 plus did not involve forced entry. We have no idea how many of those were because of a loss of key control, because of somebody having access to that building already and just walking in and doing awful things, and how many of them were surreptitious entry because they do not investigate it. If there is no forced entry, they never assume surreptitious entry. I've spoken to prosecutors. I've spoken to feds. I've spoken to police that work the forensics unit as the mass state troopers. And he said to me, you know, I've been doing this forever, and nobody's ever brought me a lock. And I can do it. I can look at the tool mark analysis, but none of our investigators ever bring me a lock to look at. So when people say to you, locks only keep, nobody uses lock picks, they use bricks to break in, et cetera, et cetera, we have no idea what these actual numbers are. All we know is that a third of break-ins didn't require force. We don't know what percentage of those might have been surreptitious. I doubt it's high, but if we're never looking, then we can't tell people that thieves only use bricks. So if you have an intrusion, investigate it actually make use of tool mark analysis. Forensic people can do this. It is no different than tool mark analysis on almost anything else. You can look at it, get some good photos, and start comparing it to tools. We undervalue all of this. Again, it is absurd for me to have to say it, but locks still have a role in security. We undervalue all of this. So cut it out. Thank you very much. This is how you get a hold of me.